In today's episode of the Heart and Hustle podcast, we sit down with Elena Frank, the CEO and founder of Jewish Fraternity Foundation. Now, in today's episode, we're going to learn about what is happening when it comes to fertility, the challenges that we face, the importance of community, why so many people are waiting so late to have children in life today, what that means for the impact of our next generation, and so much more. Let's get into the episode. But I spent five years trying to have my now five-year-old. And if I would have known the love that I feel for him, even though it wasn't the family I envisioned or like the child that I envisioned creating, I thought I would have only biological kids. Like I wish people could understand the connection you have with a child that you are raising and that you brought into this world. Um, I wish I could like yell that because there are so many options to growing your family um, and just being flexible enough to like look at that. Ilana, we're facing a big problem in society today. It seems like less people are having children at a young age. A lot of people are challenged with fertility, and that is in the middle of what you guys are doing at the Jewish Fertility Foundation. Why is this work so important to you? It's personal. I, um, I have three kids born from various treatments in two different countries, and I'm part of the famous infertility club, which sucks. So I started this organization out of my own personal suffering and um, loneliness and isolation. When it comes to kind of the community that you guys have built, one of the things that we talk about in the podcast often is isolation and loneliness from like a macro societal level seem to be rising every single year. Why is community something that's so important as people go through these challenging times together? You know, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example of um, on October 7th, which was a horrible day for many um, we're not a political organization. We're not talking about, you know, what's going on in the Middle East. Like we don't do that, but we have somehow created this unit, this family around a shared common experience, which in our case is infertility. It's, we always say it's a club. Nobody wants to join. And my staff, my team was able to pull together it was on Zoom, a meaningful program on the anniversary of 10-7, which was just a few days ago. We brought together so many people virtually who are our people. And it didn't make the day feel better. You know, there's still stuff going on in the world that are, is really hard. But to be able to be with like-minded people who have that like one shared, unique, common thread, it just makes you feel less alone and less, you know, stuck in your house, less something's wrong with me. Um, and it was really significant and meaningful for so many people in our in our space. When it comes to how you guys support people, I want to kind of give the audience a little bit of like an education process on what you guys do at the at the foundation, what you guys are doing to support people in the community and kind of like the origin story of how we pulled all this together. Yeah. So today we're entering our 10th year and we focus on, yeah, we Big focus congratulations. on three major areas. So one, when it comes to infertility support, money is really, really important. If you don't know, it costs upward of $20,000 to do one round of IVF. Um, and insurance is not mandated to cover this cost in many of our states nationally. So it's a really expensive process that often young individuals, young couples are not prepared for. And just because you do IVF or a fertility treatment does not guarantee a child. So you could be spending thousands and thousands of dollars in order to hopefully have that child. And if you want another child, you might have to go back and do it again. So one of the um, support areas that we focus on is the financial piece. The second area we say is honestly equally as important as money. It's offering emotional support. Because even if for some reason you work for a company that does provide some sort of insurance coverage, 
or you yourself have the means or your family can help out, there's still that toll that, like you were saying, the community piece, like we're we're broken. Our bodies are broken, um, whether it is the man, the woman, or various other reasons. Like it is isolating. It makes you feel just like, what is wrong with me? And even if, you know, People in your world, you know, your friends sometimes are having children and you're invited to birthday parties. And like, even if they're looking out for your your own best intentions or like your own happiness, like they don't know what to say if you haven't been through this or even if you have been through this. Like people say just horrible things when they think that they're helping and like it's lonely. So it's nice to be around people who are going through something. So we offer emotional support. We offer support groups. We offer a peer-to-peer <laughs> mentorship program. We um, offer um, lots of, you know, we're in this day and age, like Instagram live support groups. Um, and then the last piece of our prong is education. So like when I was going through my journey, almost now 15 years ago, I was doing such sketchy things in the basement of a doctor's house because I wanted a baby and I wanted it now. But the internet wasn't what it is today. And even the internet that it is today is, are we providing the right information? We want to make sure that, you know, the medical community is engaging with our community. Um, And so we do lots of local community programs as well as um, very much working with the community leadership to train them. We work very closely with the doctors to work with them. In summary, that was that was way too long. But moral of the story is that our organization offers money, emotional support, and education. Equally important, all three problems. Absolutely. I want to talk about the, uh, the education element. You know, one of the things that is pretty... I would say famous from a user experience is whenever we feel like we don't have answers to our own body and our own health, we naturally go to things like the internet and go down the WebMD dark hole. Now, I think that it's really important to address why education from a trusted resource is so important because when you're in times of insecurity and you know you don't have a sound mind about what the future is going to look like, it's very easy to start hopping on Reddit forums and everything else that could kind of diminish our our positive outlook for the future of what we're trying to build, right? Absolutely. So we partner with organizations like the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, uh, Resolve, organizations that are offering not only like the physical uh, reproductive health best practices, but also emotional, like the mental health best practices for working with individuals going through an infertility journey. And it's really important, number one, to advocate advocate for yourself. And if you are the type of person that isn't going into a doctor's office and having blind faith, which is okay, and you want to, you know, go on the World Wide Web and go down a deep, dark hole, there are resources that we would guide our audience um, to check out, you know, like they have the stamp of approval by Jewish Fertility Foundation. Also, in terms of advocating, we want our clients, we call them clients, to feel prepared for these conversations. If something feels icky or if you don't, um, you know, you don't like what your doctor said, it's okay. You're also allowed to get a second opinion just because this is out of your comfort zone or your area of expertise. We do want to empower you with the understanding that like you can ask questions And you also have the ability to really think about who you want as your doctor, because they're going to be, it's not just like an in and out process, right? Like you're going to be with this person for a significant time period. And also it's not, I don't want to say it's not, it's not true science, but the truth is there, there's always this, like, there's the medicine, there's the doctors, there's the laboratory, and there, there's this other factor. So I might say like the God factor, But just because you are doing a protocol that your doctor is recommending, it does not mean that it's going to necessarily equal a baby. And um, coming in prepared is important, but like with the right information. Let's talk about kind of the macro problems that we're dealing with in society here today. You know, me being a millennial born in 1990, um, more and more of my friends are having children later and later in life. 
Now, what do you think is happening from a societal perspective? Are there perspectives from a generation? Is there societal pressure coming from financing? What's happening here? What do you think? Well, as a whole, like our parents are telling us to go to college, go to graduate school, then think about getting married and settling down and then, you know, start your family, but make sure you have enough money to start your family. And I think over time, that pressure has come from the generations before. Um, unfortunately, biology doesn't wait. And so even if companies are you know, trying to promote egg freezing, which I happen to think is a great option. Again, it doesn't mean that that is going to equal a baby in the future. So I don't have a solution. I think with the, um, the amazing medical innovations that are happening, it's giving so many pe more people options. But like, wouldn't it be great if we could get all those things and like focus on our careers and focus on what makes us happy while also ensuring that we could have the family that we envisioned? I mean, like my third son was born when I was 40. I worked really, really hard for him. And ultimately, we used an embryo donation to have him. Like that is something crazy, innovative, different. People don't even know that that's an option. Um, but many times, you know, single parents by choice, both men and women will come to me at like 43 and be like, I waited too long. Help me. I provide that option. I try to help match them. But like, I wish they would have come to me at 39 or 38 when they were like, gosh, I haven't met that person of my dreams. I really want a kid. Um, it just makes the process a little bit easier. But tell our parents to stop pressuring us to get educated. Just kidding. I mean, that's 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 a, that's a real thing, though. You know what I mean? Like the expectation as we've gone through the generations have completely changed. I mean, I think about just like the the perceived, I'll put it that way, economic pressure that is on the younger generations to be able to have the career that you want, to be able to buy a house, to be able to have a car, to be able to have six months of savings. And then we're talking about the experience of having children on top of that. Yep. And I think the younger generations coming from the place of how am I supposed to figure all of this out? And it's really challenging for people to navigate that uncertain future. I don't have the answer. I'm trying to raise three boys to be like good humans. And we focus so much on education, right? Like I don't want them necessarily having a kid when they're ripe to have a child. I have boys. It's a little bit different. You know, you guys have a little bit more longevity than our eggs. But um, yeah, I mean, if I had a girl, like would I want them to procreate at 20 years old? No. But also I know, I know based on like biology, that mid 20 mark, that is like the best time to be able to biologically have a kid. Yeah. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of pressure. Um, I want to, I want to take this in a little bit of an interesting perspective with all of the things that we see on like social media and everything else like that. Do you think that these macro systems of engagement and social platforms are putting pressure on people to kind of start families later? But is there gonna be a bigger effect? Because we have 10,000, maybe the number is as high as 12,000 people every day turning 65 in our country. So we have a silver tsunami that's occurring, but we have less people at a younger age who are having children. And I don't know how we're gonna be able to meet the needs of our future generations if we also have the social pressure of social media, Instagram, TikTok, and everything like that that says, go build your career first. It seems like we're kind of heading towards a glass cliff, if you know what I mean. I don't know. Is that like our next nonprofit that we're going to create together? Like, we could. Oh, we definitely yeah. could. I mean, I think like religion plays a part in that. You know, I'm from the Jewish faith. In my community, there is pressure to have children, especially in the more observant population. Like the expectation is, is you get married young and start your family. Like that's the goal. And in some, in some circles, you're talking about six kids, eight kids, like, Maybe we got to turn back to not just Judaism, but like these faith based religions and really, I don't know, like maybe that that's kind of the next media pitch. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of validity in that. You know, I think we've gotten to the place and I don't want to take this into like, you know, two of a polarizing position on the podcast. But, you know, it seems like we have as a macro society gotten away from a lot of the faith based traditions. You know what I mean? And it seems like it's having a huge impact on our society. And I do worry that every someday 
people are going to wake up at the age of 43, 45, like we talked about and said, wait, did I miss my opportunity to bring children into this world? Which is kind of scary to think about. I think it's like the individual versus the community. It's very, listen, I want my kids to have everything. I want them to be happy humans and like productive and educated. But like, you're right, at the expense of the whole, the community, right? You want to a community is not only about themselves. It's about everybody else around them. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's a, it's an interesting time. I'm looking for some statistics right now where I can kind of see. So it says in 2023, the number of births in the U.S. decreased by 2% um, and by 3% in 2022. Now, it's really interesting just to kind of think about from 2007 to 2023, the number of births has decreased by 17 percent and the general uh, fertility rates has decreased by 21 percent since its recent high in 2007. So we've got some macro statistics that are also kind of impacting us as well. Where do you think that stuff's coming from? That's a good question. I have no idea, honestly. I mean, do you ever do you ever pay attention to, you know, like diet all the other macro things that people are talking about a lot. I hear a lot about these days, like, you know, microplastics and our diet and the things that we're exposed to. What's your two cents on that? Eh, I mean, I'm not sure. Listen, like we were so hyper-focused on infertility. So we say that like 25% of infertility comes from the female, 25% of it male, 25% completely unexplained. And then 25 is like the man and woman together cause infertility. I would think about like that 25%, like doctors don't know why that's happening. Um, I don't know statistically if those percentages have shifted over the years. But like, if you look about health, I am not a doctor. I'd be curious, like, why are, you know, why are our daughters getting their periods so early? Maybe because of the hormones in their milk and, you know, all the things that we hear. But like, what is that 25% that is causing us not to be able to have a baby? I don't know what it is, but like, what environmental factors? And like, are those rates the same in the U.S. every, or in the world nas- internationally? I'm well, not that's sure. a good question. Um, I don't know. Yeah, this is this is actually really interesting uh, to kind of think about. And I don't have the statistics in front of me, so I don't want to kind of like you know derail us here. Um, I want if you're okay with it, I'd like to you know create an opportunity for the audience to connect with us, and we can talk about kind of your personal journey if that's okay with you. So you had your third son at the age of forty. So recognizing that you often might be considered as somebody who waited some time to start having their children. Did you ever receive any type of pressure from your community, from the family, from the faith about, you know, trying to get on board with having children? So my journey actually started when I was 28 and it took those many years to be able to grow my family. So the first like year and a half, I had just, I got married, thought I was going to have a million babies. And my husband and I, we made Aliyah. We moved to Israel from America. And like, I wasn't on birth control for already a year. Um, and like, we were trying really hard. And I'm used to like being able to get what I want when I try hard. <laughs> and um, it was, we were not getting pregnant. And I'm like that type A personality. What is going on? What's wrong? I immediately went to the doctor. I was already um, trying to understand a country that like is a social, offers socialized medicine. So it's a different system than America, which was, which was new and different. And they quickly said, how long have you been married? Not how long have you been trying to have a baby? Trying. In America, if you've been trying to have a baby for over a year, at that age under 30, that's considered infertility. In Israel, they're try they're trying to understand like it's a different um, application. Like if you've been married over a year, that's infertility. So they put me on medicine, Clomid, and that was going to stimulate ovulation, blah, blah, blah. I was going to get pregnant month after month. Nothing was happening. I confided in my aunt in Israel and she, I was getting pressure, not from the religious component. She's not religious, but mm-hmm. like Israeli society is very direct. They're like, she's like, what is going on? Why are you not having kids? You know, do you know how to have sex? Do you need to take a vacation? All the things that you're not supposed to say to somebody who 
for whatever reason is not having a child. And like, I, that was the first time anybody put pressure on me because nobody else was asking. Because in my community, it is like you get married, especially in your later 20s and you have babies. Like that's just the expectation. And I was like, oh my God, maybe we, something really is wrong. She worked in the healthcare system, gave me the name of a doctor. And he was like a legit doctor. We went to his house for private um, sessions in the evening for his private clinic, paying him money in a country that is supposed to offer free health care. But he was a private doctor and he was doing IUIs or like the turkey baster method um, in his basement. Like my husband was going to the bathroom, doing his business, coming out with his sperm. The doctor looked under a microscope and he would put it in me. Never once checked me. And we were doing this for months. And it was weird, but like I didn't have any, you know, online link to look at for education. I didn't know how to talk about this. How awkward is this? I didn't want to bring my parents into this because they don't need to know what's going on. And it was really isolating and lonely and nothing was working. After about a year of doing sketchy things. Can we can we pause really quick? Yeah. I want to I know, like, just because this is really helpful for the audience, what were some of the conversations that you were having with your husband at that point in time? So we it get so a little bit hard. of pressure. It was yeah. so hard. Conversations were fighting because I was getting so frustrated. He was getting frustrated. He didn't know. I was so emotional every month that I would get my period. I was working at, like, a youth village, an immigrant youth village, and, like, with a lot of religious people. I was also gaining weight because they were pumping some hormones in me to try to make it work. And people were like touching my stomach. Am I pregnant? I'm like, no. So I was coming home with that, not getting like the physical like angst of not getting pregnant. He was seeing me frustrated, like babies in our world were like surrounding us and I didn't want to do anything or go anywhere. And he didn't know what to do with me. Like that was his biggest thing is like he wasn't going through all of this. But he was watching me. We were in marital counseling. Like, it sucked. Like, it was not fun, um, which is which is an element, like, which is also embarrassing. I didn't want to talk to my parents about, like, my my. I'm in my early stages of my marriage. And, like, it's really hard. Um, anyway, ultimately, we found a second opinion or a third opinion. And my tubes are blocked. I actually am one of the 25% that has a diagnosis. It's not like my tubes are blocked. No sperm is getting in. So if, in fact, I had gotten pregnant by a sketchy doctor, I could have had an ectopic pregnancy, which means that like it wouldn't no baby would be viable and it could really affect my health. Ultimately, I was able to do IVF very quickly and it was free. So the financial burden was off. It was still stressful. I wasn't like talking about it with anybody. I didn't know the words and language until I then had children and like realized, oh my God, I'm not the only one in the world going through this. I I can't thank you enough for sharing your story. Um, the reason why I asked that question, and I'm so appreciative for you being vulnerable enough to talk about your experience is because it seems like when we come across hardship and challenges like this in our personal lives, it's very easy to keep to ourselves. And I think there's so much value in you sharing your story because I know other people are going exactly through this at the same time and they're feeling like I don't have somebody to reach out to. So what would be a, and maybe you can give us a little bit of a personal anecdote. If you could go back in time, right, and give that younger version of Ilana the advice that she needed for not only the challenges that she was going through, but also the relationship challenges that she was going through at that time, what would you say to her just so we can give some advice to the audience? Okay, so I have two things. One is um, the outcome is not going to change of a treatment if you tell somebody. So I was always like very superstitious or like playing games with myself. If I tell somebody that I'm doing this treatment, then it's going to work or then it's not going to work. Or like, how am I going to feel if it doesn't work? Or da, da, da. And I would like be really reserved. What I learned about myself is that even when there were times that treatment wasn't working or there were losses, I wanted that support. And like, I wanted people, my people around me in a certain way. I didn't want the look from my mom of like pity. And I didn't know how to say what I needed, but like understanding that was really important. So sharing things with others, if that's what you need as a person, is not going to change the outcome of that process. 
And then the second thing I would say is I spent five years, we were trying to, I was like going back, when we moved back to America, I was going back and forth to Israel, trying to use up all my embryos because I knew that I wasn't done growing my family. And so many people were trying to have me focus on the kids that I already had and love the kids I already have, which is just like a dumb thing to say. Um, I just knew I wasn't done and like that didn't seem fair. So wasn't working going back and forth to Israel to get pregnant. We tried to adopt for several years, which was just, we failed at that. And then, like I said, we ultimately received a donated embryo. Everything happens for a reason, but I spent five years trying to have my now five-year-old. And if I would have known the love that I feel for him, even though it wasn't the family I envisioned or like the child that I envisioned creating, I thought I would have only biological kids. Like, I wish people could understand the connection you have with a child that you are raising and that you brought into this world. Um, I wish I could like yell that because there are so many options to grow in your family um, and just being flexible enough to like look at that. It doesn't have to take you five years. Like you will love this kid no matter how you brought them into the world. It's a, it's an amazing story, and I'm I'm so glad that we're able to be vulnerable enough to share your experiences here. Because you're right, I think um, often we ourselves and society puts a narrative in our head about how things are supposed to be, but going through the journey, it never seems like that's how things work out, right? But I think there's an amount of confidence, an amount of trusting in the future to say, hey, I'm still going to get this done, and the way in which it happens, I think we can be appreciative for at the end of the day. And so I love the fact that you touched on there are so many ways to be able to grow your family, because I know a lot of people today are feeling that pressure about like, if it doesn't go my way, then I don't want it. But the other side of that is being able to raise a family through alternative means, which is just as valuable. And you're a living testament to that. Thank you. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about kind of the education element. I want to talk about this. Now, when we talked about a little earlier in the episode, we talked about a trusted resource for trusted education and information. How are you guys using your guys' platform, the network, the ability to engage with people who are looking for this information through the use of technology? Have you guys built out a platform? What are you guys doing to be able to increase access to this good information? I mean, a few things. Um, one, for sure, we use social media as a way to offer support. And we love bringing in experts in the space to share not only best practices, but like I said, I I have a podcast as well. And I love bringing in um, experts in femtech. So like there's so much innovation in the reproductive space that is happening, which I mean, from like how sperm can be collected to how embryos are created to, you know, technology that you can do at home, just crazy amounts internationally of what's being done, educating and sharing those um, practices with our audience has been great. Um, one of the things that I love to work on is embryo donation matching. Um, and there's some creative technology that we use around that. And now we're actually focusing a little bit more on um, everything going on <clears throat> in the fertility space around post-RV Wade. And I don't know if you were following what was going on in Alabama in February. Oh, yeah. We had an office in Alabama and our fertility clinics were closed and we had to really quickly um, – we're not an advocacy organization, but we had to help our clients there figure out what the heck they're going to do if they're mid-cycle, if they're mid-trying um, to do a fertility procedure. We brought them to Atlanta, but it was very all very reactive. We were quickly able to bring together attorneys and doctors um, to try to understand what was going on, what was legal, what wasn't. So we bring people together in a space to share information very quickly. We want to be more proactive moving forward because this is not over. And we want to make sure our audience understands access points for reproductive 
uh, procedures, you know. So we're creating right now a website of like the safe states for reproductive access, um, specifically relating to fertility and infertility. And then also, again, we're not an advocacy organization, but we partner with lots of uh, organizations doing advocacy. What are like reporters asking from us? They're asking for testimonials, real people who have built their family in a variety of ways. And we're using social media, regular media, um, and different technological tools at our disposal to be able to get that information and education out there. I want to talk about this idea of adaptability with how fluid it seems like all the laws are from state to state and at a federal level, you guys are having to be incredibly adaptive based on the newest release of information and legislation. How is that kind of putting you in a position to think about what the future looks like for the state of the United States and being able to access services like this? Well, it's scary. I mean, you know, real life, like there are real people who, um, who, unfortunately, have to be able to access thing, things quickly. So again, like we don't really try to focus on the politics. We are more reactive, but like even getting that information out is not, even getting the information to ourselves is not, not easy. So we're very much following what our reproductive attorneys are telling us. We have a network of doctors, of attorneys. They're feeding us with the information, a lot of it in partnership with Resolve, with American Society of Reproductive Medicine. And like our goal is to really be able to distribute that information, disseminate that information to our clients and say, like, how can we quick, as quickly as possible make sure that you have the care that you need? Unfortunately, and we're not talking about abortion, but unfortunately, um, abortion is a part of our story. And like, if you're going through this treatment, like one of my, one of our clients actually also in Alabama, she had six IVF transfers for a very wanted baby, learned her baby was not viable with life and needed an abortion. And like, this was right after the overturn of Roe v. Wade, like she was in our infertility network. We were supporting her. We had to very quickly help her navigate this process. And like, that is just not what I want to be doing. I want to be helping people make sure that they can have the children that they want, not, and we already shared, they're already dealing with so much mental anguish and stress, partnerships, you know, relationships that are hard to have this added bonus of like, all of this is just ridiculous. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's like... No, it, it does. It does. Because, you know, there are elements of, and I'm just going to say this very transparently, I think uh, the media does a really good job at, you know, using language that demonizes the choice of, you know, being able to protect the mother through things like abortions. I know I have a personal friend. Um, there was a term that you used earlier when you talked about the fact that your tubes were blocked. We talked about a certain type of, what was that definite? What was that word they used? You said it, it, we had a we had if you were to get pregnant, but an example oh, of an you know ectopic pregnancy, an ectopic pregnancy. Right. So this is what is the definition of that? Just so I'm not speaking it's out like of pocket here. It's like when you're growing a fetus inside your fallopian tube. Okay, perfect. So it's not this is going to grow. Yeah. Right. It's not, it's not a viable child. Right. And this is exactly what happened to one of my close friends and she had to go into the hospital, right. To have an abortion, to be able to save her life. And I think that we have to be able to look at these things at a higher view to be able to say, Hey, where is the appropriate access point in the community for us to be able to protect life in general? And I think that sometimes the media does a really good job at saying that this is either right or wrong without the full context of what's happening. Yeah, well, we're trying to kind of shine a light on the real stories of real people who are, you know, going through some of these procedures and processes. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about what the future of the organization, the foundation looks like 10 years of advocating and doing amazing work. What does the next five years look like for you guys, Ilana? Yeah. So, I mean, we've given out more than like $2.4 million in grants. We have given out, I think like over 325, I was just looking, 325, actually 26, 
um, grants in our in our time in the past really nine years. We've helped hundreds and hundreds of people. We have partner fertility clinics. We have 10 locations nationally where we're really deep into the community um, and who we're helping. We have like built out a direct service organization. We figured out how to scale. We've got that. You, we have an amazing team on the grounds doing this, this work. Where I see us in the next five years is really making sure organizationally that we're efficient and that we're operating at the best level that we can. And we have to kind of pivot. We've been a direct service organization. We have to fundraise in order to help our organization grow, to help more people nationally, to be able to give out a lot more fertility grant money to more people, even outside of our territories, we have to really kick ass in fundraising. And so right now we're making some organizational pivots so that we kick off our 10th year with a bang. Um, so that's where I hope we see us. I want to raise $18 million over the next five years to be able to do um, continue doing what we're doing. Well, I think that this is an awesome opportunity for us to talk a little bit about how can people give back to the organization? Where can they find more information about what you guys do? And I want you also talk about, you know, the the community aspect. I talked to you about, you know, somebody in my personal life who's going through this and you gave some amazing resources. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So we, well, we work, number one, we work in the community. So we've created, I'm in Atlanta. We started our first community-based, I guess you would say chapter, um, where we are able to offer financial assistance, education, and emotional support. Our education and emotional support is to anybody, regardless of religious background. We very much love on and rely on our volunteers. Our volunteers locally can offer, um, become a fertility buddy. So they might have gone through some sort of experience, whether it's adoption, surrogacy, straight up IUI or IVF, maybe they had losses in their pregnancies. We want to match somebody up with somebody who is currently experiencing infertility. It's a great program. It's a really easy way to be able to give back. Additionally, um, we uh, have development committees in each of our locations because, again, everything we do today uh, has to have a fundraising angle to be able to support the work. Um, and then nationally, we actually just started offering the Fertility Buddies program, which is, I think, what I recommended to you. So anybody in America is able to join that program if they need some sort of emotional help while they're going through their um, their treatment process or a loss or whatever is going on. But there are a lot of ways to get involved. Um, following us on Instagram is a great way to learn more. Facebook, also great, maybe not as sexy for some of the younger people. Um, and then just our website, jewishfertilityfoundation.org. Is, is a great way to learn more if we're in a community, you know, near you. But also, if you remember, we are really expanding out to be able to help more people nationally. Ilana, what should we be talking about that maybe we didn't talk about here today? Do we miss any subjects of conversation or things that are on the front of your mind? egg freezing. We talked about embryo donation. Those are my favorite things. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think we did, we did good. Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the Heart and Hustle podcast. You are truly the definition of somebody who represents Heart and Hustle. The tradition that we have here at the end of our episodes is we have our previous guest ask you a blind question. And their question was, as the CEO of your organization, what are the three habits that you've built to be able to recharge and rest as a leader of your organization? Um. <laughs> well, these are like my personal habits. Um, number one, I really like taking bubble baths with a glass of wine after a long day. My kids know that like, just give me 10 minutes in the bath. And it like, I don't think a CEO can ever really turn off, but it does decompress me. Um, to be able to be more present during those times that, and I am not perfect at this, but during the time where I'm trying to like prepare dinners for my kids and like homework and all of that. Um, 
was the word, what was the word? Three things to recharge. Yep. So I actually get a lot of energy from working with like my executive team, which is who are all females. Like I love empowering them to kick ass, whether it's they need like a professional coach or they need, or I recognize that they need a massage, like whatever it is that gives me energy and builds me up when I can do that to them with them. Um, and three recharging is, I mean, exercise, like I want to be doing it more, but just even taking a walk. Sometimes I have my best ideas. Like if I'm struck, listen, a job of a CEO is hard. Lots of jobs are hard, but like having to deal with, um, external with a board, with your staff, taking a long walk for me, I figure things out a lot. And so I really think that's not for everybody, but it really helps ground me and like also helps my heart rate get up a little bit. Well, I think that's an amazing place for us to put a wrap on today's episode. Elana Frank, once again, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. You rock. Thank you so much.